So this text is, in a sense, the beginning of Jesus' public ministry in the Gospel of Mark. He hasn't done a whole lot just yet. He's been baptized. He's overcome the wiles of the devil in the wilderness. And he's preached a little to small gatherings of folks. But he hasn't garnered much attention or notoriety. And he hasn't really got any real followers just yet. Which makes it all the more remarkable that when Jesus begins drafting disciples, these fishermen literally drop what they're doing, just drop their nets and follow him. Of course, most of us aren't so quick to let go of the nets that entangle us. And if we're being honest, we aren't always quite so ready to follow Jesus either. A reading from Mark chapter 1, verses 16 through 20. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat, mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Amen. Please pray with me. Everlasting God, may the words of my mouth, the meditations upon all of our hearts serve to glorify you. And Lord, may they be in keeping with the teachings of our Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. What's the dumbest thing you've ever said to anyone? Rhetorical question, of course. What are those, what? <laughs> you got a volunteer? No, <laughs> I won't ask you to repeat whatever it was. I, uh, I just got back from a conference with uh, some other UCC preachers from all over the country, something I'm fortunate to do every January. It's a wonderful opportunity to develop friendships and camaraderie, as well as compare notes and discuss the joys and par uh, challenges of parish ministry. And one of the things that strikes me about clergy, myself included, uh, is how much we worry about having said something stupid, how much we worry about what people think of us, about having maybe angered someone with a controversial sermon or having said something foolish in conversation. We're terrified of putting our foot in our mouths and we are so grateful for forgiveness and grace when we inevitably do. One of the more senior members of our group, a venerable and respected pastor on the verge of retirement offered the sermon at one of our worship services that week, and he told a story that I just couldn't believe it. This pastor had officiated a wedding for a young couple in his congregation, uh, and he was at the reception of this wedding along with his wife. As the hour grew late and uh, they decided to start heading home, uh, the pastor's wife went out to start the car while the pastor stayed behind to bid farewell and a final congratulations to the couple that he had just married. Now the bride had just eaten a large bite of the wedding cake. She smiled and she said to him, I'd give you a hug, Reverend, but I've got frosting all over my face. That's okay, he replied, trying to be funny. I can just lick it off. The young woman and her husband laughed, uh, but the pastor's heart sank like a stone. Did I just say that? He wondered, silently berating himself. He walked back to the car, numbly putting one foot in front of the other, feeling horrified with himself. As he climbed inside the car, he said to his wife, you're never gonna believe what I just said to the bride. As he told the story, she Slapped her forehead, dumbfounded, but I'd say he's lucky that's all she slapped. 
He couldn't sleep that night, humiliated with what he'd said and terrified that it would be the end of him. He, he, worked, he worked up the courage to call the bride the next day and apologize. Of course, she just laughed and said that they all thought it was hilarious and never gave it another thought. The truth is we've all said some pretty dumb things in our lives. Maybe not that dumb, but you know, not far off either. After this sermon, I talked to a dozen or so other pastors who shared stories of their humiliating faux pas and stupid things they'd said to someone in the moment and immediately regretted. But of course, grace abounds. and We can forgive and move on. Of course, we don't always want to move on, do we? We take offense or assume bad intent where there is none. Or maybe there is bad intent, and we demand some kind of satisfaction or retribution. This is especially true, I think, among neighbors, or people who live close to us, or maybe even with us. I've long suspected that my own neighbors don't like me very much, uh, given my dog's incessant barking and my refusal to rake the leaves in the fall, just doing my part to conserve nature to say nothing of the fact that I backed into my next door neighbor's car twice. <laughs> to my credit, I left a note, well, two notes, and amazingly, they never said a word. They just let it go. I heard a story about two neighbors on the radio that could not let anything go. The DJ was explaining that he'd once had a long-running feud with the guy next door, what began with one guy's dog urinating on the other guy's lawn escalated into disputes about property lines, lawn care, arguments between their children, and so on and so forth. And eventually, the other guy uh, got so mad that he went to the DJ's house and when he wasn't home, and he painted a rather nasty message on his front door, which he would not repeat on the radio, and I'm sure I couldn't repeat here. The DJ said that he considered retaliation, marching over there with a bucket of paint and writing something even more vicious, even more vulgar. But then he thought about the other guy's young kids and them coming home and seeing that, and it gave him pause. So instead, he took his bucket of paint over there and wrote the words, I forgive you, on the other man's garage door, which is kind of a funny way of showing it. It's, it's a bit like lighting a, writing a letter of apology and tying it to a rock and throwing it through someone's window. <laughs> so naturally, that only escalated things further. When the other guy came home and saw it, uh, he slashed the DJ's tires, and then they had to get the police involved, and, you know, things didn't end well for anyone. Violence almost always begets violence, and retaliation seldom leads to redemption. Fighting fire with fire only adds to the flames and burns things down faster. I wonder what would happen if someone broke that cycle, turned the other cheek, disentangled themselves from the web of blame. I wonder what would happen if they just walked away, just Beat it, as Michael Jackson famously advised. Showing how funky and strong is your fight. It doesn't matter who's wrong or who's right. Just beat it. Which, of course, is preferable to the alternative. This bitterness between neighbors weighs heavily on my hearts these days, as I think it does for us all as we look to Russia and Ukraine, Israel and Gaza, and I worry if I might also one day have to read horrible news about China and Taiwan or North and South Korea. Even American states are at odds with each other, divided over reproductive rights and immigration and a looming presidential election that will surely polarize us even further. And when geopolitical neighbors resort to violence, of course, the stakes are a whole lot higher. Hundreds dead are taken hostage in Israel. 
almost 25,000 killed in Gaza, most of them civilians, many of them children. Houthis, Hezbollah, the Islamic State agitating on rests at the edges of it all, drawing in the West and threatening a wider regional conflict that could drag on interminably. It's not going to stop until someone decides to make it stop, either with a ceasefire or a diplomatic solution or, God forbid, a genocide or a nuclear bomb. This entire region is and has been for a long time caught in a web, threads of blame that go back centuries, tying everyone in inextricable knots. Israel blames Hamas and by association the rest of Palestine for the unconscionable terror attack on October 7th of last year. Meanwhile, Palestine blames Israel for occupation of the area in 1948 and for continuing to expand into Gaza and the West Bank with settlements, all the while treating them like second-class citizens. Now, I'm not a historian, but I'm sure that one could go back much, much further, even to the wars of conquest between Christians and Muslims as they fought for the Holy Land, with Jews being mostly trampled underneath. Or all the way back to ancient times when the Israelites killed everyone in Canaan and took the land to begin with. The point is, there's plenty of blame to go around. There's no end to it. There will always be someone to point the finger at, always some crime that demands retaliation. And looking ahead, we can be certain that Israel's aggression in Gaza, justified or not, will fuel further extremism among the children who survive and grow up to adopt Hamas semi-anti-Semitic ideology. Is there any way to break this cycle? Is there any way to escape from this web of mutual hatred that poisons generations as surely as a spider's bite? I don't know. I don't have any answers. And as my friend Rabbi Stephen Bob recently reminded me, I'm not preaching to Benjamin Netanyahu or the US State Department. It's not my job to offer an exit ramp to peace or to win wars or to end them. It is my job, literally, <laughs> to get up here every week and talk about Jesus, a Jew born in Bethlehem and killed in Jerusalem who tried to break the cycle of violence on the cross. And I can't help but wonder what he would have to say about all of this. In Mark's gospel, as Jesus is collecting disciples, his first stop is among the fishermen. Simon and Andrew are casting their nets into the Sea of Galilee when Jesus tells them, follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And we're told that they just immediately drop everything and follow him. And in much the same way, Jesus approaches James and John, the sons of Zebedee, and they do the same, leaving their poor old father in the boat, wondering what on earth just happened. Now, there's an interesting metaphor at work here, a beautiful metaphor. These men simply drop their nets and walk away, following Jesus. They leave behind everything they hold dear, old friends, old ambitions, old grievances. These nets that we find ourselves tangled in, these webs of crisscrossing blame and retribution, these first disciples just drop them and walk away. I suppose the less tangled up you are, the easier it is to do that. Before the back and forth goes too far, before the reputation is ruined, before the tires get slashed, before the neighborhood gets leveled, is the best time to walk away. The next best time, of course, is right now. To turn the other cheek, as Jesus later tells us. That's something that we all ought to bear in mind as we sense conflict bubbling up with our proverbial neighbors. 
to always strive for peace before it escalates to war. But what about the wider world? Looking at the news, what would Jesus do? I read one article recently that would make most people roll their eyes. The author said that instead of dropping bombs on Gaza, Israel should have dropped flyers that simply read, let's talk. I suppose that's pretty idealistic at best, and at worst it ignores the pain that folks in Israel felt on October 7th, the pain still endured by folks taken hostage and their families. But that said, maybe addressing Palestinian concerns would do more to hurt Hamas than blowing up civilians and radicalizing the survivors. Hamas' entire platform, as I understand it, is built on Palestinian grievance. Address the fundamental problems in the region, address the grievance, and maybe cut Hamas off at the knees. But I don't know, like I said, it's not my job to solve geopolitical conflicts, thanks be to God. I'm not uh, the Secretary of State or an Israeli general or a political scientist. It is my job as a preacher, and more importantly, as a follower of Jesus, like those first disciples, to promote peace, because that's what Jesus did. And to think that we can ever attain peace via war is absurd. That's Roman ideology. Pax Romana, the idea that peace is only achieved when all of one's enemies have been beaten into submission and can no longer fight. It's also pretty Orwellian, if you've read 1984 lately. War is peace, according to Big Brother, but not according to Jesus or John Denver, as he sings in his much beloved song, Last Night I Had the Strangest Dream. Last night, I had the strangest dream I ever dreamed before. I dreamed the world had all agreed to put an end to war. I dreamed I saw a mighty room. The room was filled with men, and the paper they were signing said they'd never fight again. And when the papers were all signed and a million copies made, they all joined hands and bowed their heads and grateful prayers were prayed. And the people in the streets below were dancing round and round in guns and swords and uniforms were scattered on the ground. 